The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom in order to learn the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. <clears throat> Here it says, Watch for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are voracious wolves. Watch for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are voracious wolves. Now, false prophets have a counterfeit to every Bible doctrine ever taught or ever originated from God the Father. Religion rejects Christianity through counterfeiting. First of all, a religion counterfeits doctrine. That's found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. So you can hold your place and flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And here it talks about how doctrine is counterfeited and how Satan himself, through the cosmic system, counterfeits Bible doctrine. You see, in the unique spiritual life, we have uh, something that God has developed, the protocol spiritual life. Now, I'm going to plug this in and show you something that I taught earlier. Dealing with the great divide. Now that was under a concept when... Uh, Nobody was here except for Jimmy. But he was interested in it. That was nice. So we have the uh, cosmic system on the one hand and the spiritual life on the other hand. Now this thing doesn't want to stay up anymore, so I'll just hold it. So we have the spiritual life over here. Now this is what God has developed through the prototype spiritual life of Jesus Christ. And we have the protocol, of course. And then on the other side, we have the cosmic system. Now under the cosmic system, this is the counterfeit. The cosmic system is the counterfeit. The spiritual life is the absolute. It's what God has provided. And Satan always has a counterfeit to what God has provided. Satan has a counterfeit to the laws of divine establishment. He has a counterfeit, actually, to the four divine institutions. What is Satan's counterfeit to volition? Satan says, well, volition really isn't the issue. It's environment. And Satan says, environment controls volition. And then marriage. As Satan says, oh, you really don't need marriage. Man can be with man. Woman can be with woman. Man can be with uh, 20 women. It doesn't really matter. A marriage isn't that significant. And that's the counterfeit. And then family. And what does Satan say with regards to family? With regards to family under the cosmic system, Satan says it takes a village. And God says it takes a family. Now, you know, Hillary Clinton wrote a book called It Takes a Village. No, it takes a family, not a village. Your children aren't to be raised by society. They're to be raised by family, the third divine institution. But if you're in the cosmic system, you say, no, it takes a village. If you're in under divine establishment, whether you're an unbeliever or a believer under divine establishment, you say, no, it takes a family. Then, of course, the fourth divine institution is nationalism. On the, on the actually on the divine establishment side, see this is split up into two different areas. 
We have spiritual life on the one hand and divine establishment on the other hand. Divine establishment can apply to unbeliever and believer. And the unbeliever can function under divine establishment and the unbeliever can be patriotic. He would be functioning under nationalism. That's God's system. But under the cosmic system, it's internationalism. Under the cosmic system, it's go to the UN to solve all your problems instead of uh, solving them autonomously through your own country. So it's a great divide. And here we were studying the great divide uh, between family members. And uh, it just so happened uh, some people were having those problems between family members. But it's part of scripture. And there is a great divide between that. And that's because there's a counterfeit. And religion rejects Christianity through counterfeiting doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, what is later times? Or what are the latter days, as you, your Bibles might say? The latter days are the church age. Remember that when 1 Timothy was being written, the Apostle Paul had not yet uh, concluded all of his writings, neither had the canon of Scripture been completed. Therefore, later times is a reference to when the canon would be completed. And it's a reference to the church age. It's not a reference to uh, some type of sign pointing toward the tribulation. Definitely not. The later days deal with this age. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the church age, some will depart from the faith by giving heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Doctrines of demons are counterfeit doctrines. You see, the unique spiritual life says, hey, you have the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. The unique spiritual life says, look, you have Operation Z where you can perceive, metabolize, and imply and apply the Word of God. Counterfeit doctrines come along and say, Hey, buy this holy rag that I've wiped my forehead with and you can buy it and then receive a blessing. They really do that on Christian television today. So-called Christian. Uh, they're so far from Christianity, it's disgusting. Or uh, go to a Benny Hinn meeting and get uh, healed or uh, buy a cup of this holy water and we'll pray over it for you and you can order it for $29.99 and you'll receive a blessing. I'm tempted to go on television, wipe my butt with a rag and show it to them and stamp it holy crap and say, here you go, $29.99. And then when they received it, at least, they, at least then they would smell the stench and have enough sense to know that they were idiots. So nobody laughed at that. But it's funny. And, and I'm bringing out the point that, look, this isn't the spiritual life that these false teachers teach. It has nothing to do with the spiritual life. And yet they try to uh, say these things. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 20 through 21, turn there as well. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 through 21. This deals with counterfeiting the communion table. Counterfeiting the communion table. They did this as well, especially a lot uh, during the time of the Corinthians. The Corinthians were a wild bunch of people and they counterfeited everything. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in communion and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. This is counterfeiting communion with their former religious ceremonies. And they had a lot of formal religious ceremonies in which they would try to uh, counterfeit the Lord's table. And they would always want to go back to their former lifestyle as unbelievers in which they worship the pagans, in which they would go into the temple, uh, the former temple where they worshipped, and uh, just pick up a prostitute. Of course, they had to give it themselves free of charge, and that is how they would function, completely outside of the spiritual life, but counterfeited in 1 Corinthians 10, 20 through 21. 
then there will be counterfeit ministers. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13 through 15. Hop over to 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now this is Satan's cosmic system. It is a counterfeit system. And most Christians today are sucked into Satan's system. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And if you ever have the unfortunate event of watching Christian television, or TNT, or whatever they call it, when they get on television and they have people who come out and faith heal, as they call it, they're counterfeiting doctrine. They are counterfeiting uh, the Word of God. And they are false apostles. They are false prophets. And anyone who calls themselves an apostle today, and anyone who calls themselves a prophet today, is a false prophet, a false apostle. That gift is extant. It does not exist anymore. There's no need for it. The church has already been established. And yet, they want to go back to these old things. And these old things were a lower form of the spiritual life. They only had that so that people would recognize who an apostle was and who a prophet was. And now, since they've been recognized, we have a higher form of the spiritual life in which all of us stand on an equal footing. All of us can learn the unique spiritual life from the filling of God the Holy Spirit. I'm no different from you. And you can learn the unique spiritual life from the filling of God the Holy Spirit and from using Operation Z. All of us. And there's no a special person with a special gift. We all have different gifts, of course, but all of these flashy gifts are gone. And for them to come out and try to force this on Christianity is a shame. It's a false doctrine. It's Satan trying to get people's eyes off of the truth and onto something that is valueless. It's valueless. You have to come to understand what love is all about, uh, both impersonal love for mankind and personal love for God the Father. And we find that in Corinthians where the Apostle Paul talks about a clanging symbol. Well, these are people with the flashy spiritual gifts. And if they have a flashy spiritual gift but have not love, they are nothing. So what if they had a flashy spiritual gift? They're nothing when it comes to the unique spiritual life which we've been given. It's better than. Now it's invisible. It's not visible anymore. And that's a good thing because it actually indicates something better. So then we have the counterfeiting of the gospel found in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguise themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his servants, that is, those functioning under the cosmic system, it is not strange if his servants, Satan's servants, those under the cosmic system, also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Now they're holding to a form of the spiritual life. It's a form of it. It is not the spiritual life. But they hold to a form of the spiritual life. Maybe they use a holy language. Maybe they dress in a holy manner. Maybe they wear a collar around here and, and then speak with a high voice and go through all of that uh, trying to appear holy to man. You're holding to a form of the spiritual life. So it is not strange if his servants themselves as servants uh, also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. Now this is something that we have to understand, that none of us are judged according to our sins. All of our sins were judged on the cross. We are punished for our sins. We are not judged for our sins. 
There's a distinction. Remember, Jesus Christ had all of our sins imputed to him and judged on the cross. We cannot be judged for our sins. We will not be judged for our sins. Neither will we as believers, nor will the unbeliever be judged for their sins. Their sins, too, were imputed to Christ and judged. They simply rejected the cross. Therefore, uh, they will uh, never uh, come to have a relationship with God. So none of us are judged according to our sins. Our sins were judged on the cross. Our human good, however, is subject to judgment. Jesus Christ did not die as a substitute on the cross for our human good. Remember in the garden there's the tree of, no of the knowledge of good and evil. And the knowledge of good doesn't mean it's divine good. It's human good. And human good was not judged on the cross. It will be judged later. And for the believer, it will be judged at the Bema, the evaluation throne. And all of the good deeds that we ever did out of fellowship as a believer, all the times that we went out and witnessed in carnality, all of the times that we went out and gave to the poor in carnal carnality, all the times that we helped someone else and someone else who in need while we were in carnality, all of these things will be burned in a great bonfire, and all the believers will be standing around watching it. And for those who are losers, all of their good deeds, their human good, will be burned, and they will escape from the fire, as it says uh, from the, the apostle Peter. They'll escape from the fire, and they'll be saved, and they won't go to hell. But that's, they won't have anything to show. No divine good from the production inside the unique spiritual life. But for the unbeliever, they will be judged on the basis of human good. And this will occur at the last judgment, not at the Bema. The Bema occurs during the tribulation, those seven years. Then we have a millennium that lasts for a thousand years. Then after the, the millennium, we have the last judgment. And at the last judgment... Uh, all the unbelievers will be brought up from Hades. Not from hell. There really isn't a hell right now. It's Hades, a place of torments. Later there'll be a lake of fire. And then uh, when their human good is compared with God's perfect righteousness, God says, all right, you've, uh, you have performed 1,700,000 good deeds. They equal to minus R. They do not equal my righteousness. Therefore, you are going to the lake of fire. And the judgment is, is, is handled right then, and the gavel goes down, and they go straight to the lake of fire. So we are judged on the basis of human good. And in effect, uh, even the believer is judged on the basis of human good at the evaluation. Because if you've spent your whole life simply working in the energy of the flesh rather than being filled with God the Holy Spirit, if you've spent your whole life judging, maligning, and gossiping others, or if you've spent your whole life raising hell and saying, oh, goodbye God, I'll see you in eternity, all the good works that you do in the meantime during that temporary stay on the earth, and remember, our stay on the earth, no matter how old we are right now, is very, very temporary. As James says, our life is like a vapor trail, and if it's a clear summer day or any type of clear day throughout the year, you can see vapor trails going across the sky, and if you watch them long enough, they all fade away very quickly. That is our lifespan. It's a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. So we must learn to live our lives in the light of eternity. We have to always be oriented to eternity. How long is eternity? Forever and ever and ever and ever. And when we are in heaven for a zillion years, our lifespan, even if we live to be the oldest man on the face of the earth and we live to be 120, it would not even equal a smidgen of a drop in a bucket. It wouldn't even get close to a drop in the bucket. So when the details of life start to grow like weeds and strangle you because you're worried about life, and when you put Bible doctrine number 10, remember the only thing you can take into heaven is the word of God that you've accumulated on earth. As the country song says, there is no luggage rack on a hearse. And you might have worked very hard your whole life, and that's commendable to work hard. But you may have done it 
and you may be proud of all that you've achieved and all that you have, but when you die, all of that stuff stays right here. It goes nowhere. And it'll be left to a bunch of relatives who probably don't have sense about money, and it will be wasted away within a couple of years. For the most part, that's the way it goes for most people. What worth was it? It was of no value. It was of a little value while you were alive on the earth, but a zillion years from now, while you're in the eternal state, you're not going to thinking about how much money you could have made doing thus and so. You won't care. And you'll be awful sad that you put Bible doctrine at number two or three or ten instead of number one. You'll say to yourself, I would have rather been gathering up eternal wealth and if you're distracted because of other things, such as a television show or something else, it, it's not, uh, I, it, I don't say this because I want to see a bunch of faces. That's not the case. I say these things because I know how important the spiritual life is. And I'm not bragging that that's what I do for my life. That's what I do for a living. Learn the Word of God, and I know how important it is. I know also how important it is to work and to provide for your family, but it's one hour a day, folks. It's not, uh, it's, it's not like, it's, not like uh, it's during the time of the Apostle Paul when he would probably uh, get up for four hours straight and demand your attention, as he did uh, in the past, in which uh, people would be sitting on the windowsill and get sick of him talking and fall out and die. Then he'd have to go down and resuscitate them and say, you should have been listening. <laughs> so Galatians chapter 3, 2 through 3, also talks about a counterfeit system. A counterfeit system. And people come up with a counterfeit system to salvation. They come up with a counterfeit system to the spiritual life as well. Now, you might not take me very seriously, but you need to take the Word of God very seriously. And always remember, it's not the man, it's the message. I am a flawed, imperfect person, just as any of you. And what you need to realize, it's, it's not the person behind the pulpit. It's what is being taught. And I guarantee you, you will not get this anywhere else in this state. Maybe not in a lot of other states as well, but I will hold off on that in order not to sound too pretentious or arrogant. But I know where I stand, and it doesn't really matter my personality or what I say behind this pulpit. What matters is, am I teaching the Word of God correctly? So Galatians 3, 2 through 3. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? This is a question, a question that the Galatians should already know how to answer. But what happened was, everywhere the Apostle Paul went, he would go to all of these different places around the world. And when he got there, people would be right there behind him, ready to distort his message. And he would go into a town and say, faith alone and Christ alone. Or he would go into a town and say, you're saved by faith, you live the spiritual life. Uh, you were saved by grace, you live the spiritual life by grace. And then as soon as he would trot off to another town, the legalists, the Judaizers would be right behind him, ready to destroy his message. So he had to come back to Galatia and send them a letter. And he says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, it's by hearing the gospel and believing it, of course. It's by hearing and then faith. You heard the gospel, then you believed it. That is how you were saved. And then he goes on to rebuke them. You see, it's funny how all of the, uh, if you go to a church and they have a stainless glass of the Apostle Paul, usually it's some meek, mild, holy-looking, pious-looking face. 
But I tell you what, the Apostle Paul was just as tough as our Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes he got a little tougher because he had an old sin nature and he had an ability to go a bit over the top. And he did. And some of those letters that were a bit over the top never made it to Scripture. Because he, he probably, I would love to read some of them, but it was his old sin nature. And he probably ripped them to shreds. I mean just uh, literally, because he was a genius, first of all. So he knew how to be very sarcastic. And he's really being sarcastic here. And he says, are you so foolish? Now, re remember we studied in Matthew where it says, if you call a brother a fool, you're in danger of hell fire. So realize that uh, that translation is a bit off, and you've got to know the context of it. If you call your brother, a, if you call a brother a moron because they're teaching the gospel, then you're in danger of hell, hell fire because you've not believed in Christ. So here's the apostle Paul using the word foolish, calling them foolish. Are you so foolish? Having begun with the spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? When we all believe in Christ, we begin with the filling of God the Holy Spirit. We start off with a clean slate. We have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. We immediately have the ability to get with the unique spiritual life. Yet, they were led astray by the Judaizers, by the legalists. And then the Apostle Paul had to come back and say, Are you so foolish? Having begun with the Spirit, the filling of God the Holy Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? You've gone back to your fleshly ways. You're not being, you're not operating under the filling of God the Holy Spirit. You are rather operating under the sin nature. You're operating under the energy of the flesh. And you think that by circumcision, somehow you're going to impress God. And you think that by doing other things in the energy of the flesh, you're going to impress God. And the Apostle Paul is saying, you are foolish. And this is a part of distorting doctrine and it was distorted it always will be and doctrinal teachers are always the ones who receive uh, the most attacks and if ever uh, the attacks stop coming toward me I will say to myself I must be doing something wrong because uh, people do react to the Word of God because it's the truth it steps on their toes and they don't like it. What you see, they're self-absorbed. They're so filled with themselves, they can't get past themselves. And they always, he insulted me. No, I insulted what you think, but it might not even be your fault that's the way you were raised. Now it's time to have a change of mind. And if I did not present it in that manner, uh, they would sit there as if they were in any other church and not comprehend a thing. So you say, if only you had taught that a little softer, so-and-so would be here today. No, so-and-so would still not be here today because so-and-so is stuck on his or her self. And if you just think about it, you might come to realize, hey, you know, you're right. So-and-so is stuck on themselves. That's all they do. Talk about themselves. Me, 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 me. Anybody who talks about me, 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 me all the time cannot learn the Word of God because they think of themselves as being so important they're above all that. And they have a right to be offended. Nobody has a right to be offended. Uh, what you have a right to do is evaluate yourself and say, you know, it was wrong the way I was raised. So what? It's time to have a change of mind. And look at the Apostle Paul. He didn't pull any punches. Are you so foolish? 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10, it deals with a counterfeit power. And Satan, of course, has a counterfeit power. Especially in the tribulation, a lot of this counterfeit power will be made known. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will annihilate by the breath of his mouth. This will be the tactical 
victory. Remember, the strategic victory was won on the cross. This is one of the odd occasions in which the strategic victory comes first and the tactical victory comes later. In this war on terror, we've had tactical victories in Iraq and Afghanistan. The strategic victory would be complete annihilation of terrorists. Well, our Lord went ahead and dealt with the strategic first and got, uh, well, defeated Satan strategically. It's over for him. But he doesn't realize it yet, so now he's going to have to do it tactically. So he, he uh, well, he strategically defeated the terrorist Satan. Now he must tactically throw him into hell. And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will annihilate by the breath of his mouth. In other words, he's just going to breathe from his mouth, and Satan is going to be cast into the lake of fire and wipe out by the manifestation of his second coming. The second coming is when our Lord returns to the earth and actually uh, steps foot on the earth. For the resurrection, we meet the Lord in the clouds in the air. The second advent is when he actually touches the earth and actually splits a mountain in half. The presence of the lawless one will be dictated by Satan's modus operandi. Notice the corrected translation. The presence of the lawless one will be dictated by Satan's modus operandi. With all power, the lawless one is, by the way, the Antichrist. With all power... <clears throat> and by means of miracles, even wonder miracles of the lie. Then in ver chapter 10, verse 10, followers of the man of lawlessness, and with every kind of evil deception of unrighteousness for those who are being led astray, deprived, and destroyed. This word destroyed is an action that has not yet taken place. But the syntax says it is a future certainty. This is going to happen in the tribulation. And Paul is writing what he is told by God from the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And this syntax is indicating that the Apostle Paul is not happy that so many are going to believe the lie. He's not happy because so many are going to be negative toward the word of God. And he is not happy that they will be utterly destroyed and sent to the lake of fire. You see, the Apostle Paul was very tough. But he, was also, he also had a very tender spot. And that tender spot was always related, for the most part, to doctrine, except when he would go into sin. And then he had a tender spot for Israel, for the Jew. Otherwise, it was always a tender spot for doctrine. And when people would often reject his message as he went from town to town, and especially when the Jews would reject his message, sometimes he would uh, break down and cry. Now, it was, it was a good emotion. He wasn't crying because they had rejected him. He knew that they were rejecting God. He didn't sit down and say, oh, woe is me, except when he was out of fellowship. Most times he just sat down and said, nobody cares Nobody's listening. Every time I go somewhere, somebody's right behind me to destroy everything that I just uh, built up by teaching faith alone and Christ alone and by teaching grace. And all the legalists are coming behind me. And so he would sit down and weep. Very tender, yet very strong at the same time. So the point is there's nothing wrong with good emotion. And you might say, well, that's a terrible thing. It is, but it welled up inside of him because of his love for Bible doctrine. And he did not want to see anyone forsake the Word of God. He did not want to see anyone not receive Jesus Christ as Savior or believe in him. He never wanted to see that. So when uh, he's teaching here about the tribulation, what it brings out in this word destroyed, it's actually S-I, it's a, a sick present, S-I-C, in the Greek. And that means it hasn't taken place, but it will. And the syntax is saying the Apostle Paul is disturbed by that. The Apostle Paul is disturbed by something that's going to happen way after his lifetime. Why? Because he's concerned about people believing in Christ. He really does have a true love for people. It's just that sometimes people confuse tough love with arrogance. 
And the Apostle Paul was anything but arrogant. He was being tough because he knew it would be the only way for them to wake up. And he never compromised except once. That's recorded in Scripture. Actually, maybe uh, twice, but they were all related to the same event. And so he had compromised in the past, and that is when he almost died to sin face to face with death. But when he wasn't compromising, he was being very tough and at the same time very loving. So do not misconstrue tough with arrogant. It's not true. Remember, Moses had to deal with two million Jews, believers who hated him, and he was tough with them, yet he loved them very much. And you know, he had the character and the love for them that God came down to him one day and said, Look, Moses, these people are a stiff-necked, rebellious people. I'll tell you what. I'll wipe all of them out, and we'll start out with just you. Well, that would have been a solution for Moses right there because he would have said, Yeah, man, and just get rid of all of these nags that have been nagging me my whole life. Start out with me, and I can relax with me and my wife and have a long vacation. But he had such love, such impersonal love, that he said, no, don't wipe them out, Father. And he, he pleaded with them. And then he went so far as to say, uh, remember, uh, remember uh, Isaac, who later, or remember Jacob, who later became Israel. In other words, remember God, not that he had to remind him. You see, this was a test from God, really, to Moses. And not that uh, Moses had to remind him, but he was stating a principle of doctrine to God. And he said, remember Jacob, who later became Israel. In other words, remember the young people who are growing in grace. Maybe they're not there yet, but they might get there. So spare their parents and spare them too, because they might go to maturity. And God knew he was going to say all that. So God said, all right, I grant you that, Moses. But Moses was right, and he showed a tremendous amount of humility. Yet he was so tough, all the little nitpicks, all the little rebellious people in Israel always got up and said, he is so arrogant. He's so arrogant to talk to me that way. And then later on, Scripture says Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth at that time. It's a tough love. In those moments when he's being tough, he's reproving and correcting. And then in his private time with the Lord, he might be very kind and saying, just give him a chance to get with this, Lord. You have to understand the difference between personality and the message. And if you get hung up on personality, you'll never get past that and you'll never grow up spiritually. Because I'll tell you what, there are a lot of sweet personalities out there where you can go and listen to a bunch of blather, listen to a bunch of crap that's not related to Scripture, and have a wonderful social life with all the other people who love to get their ears tickled and listen to blather. But you won't grow up spiritually. Wouldn't you rather grow up spiritually? I hope so. If not, enjoy yourself lavishing around in blather and just have a good time and uh, enjoy it when you don't receive your rewards and are ashamed as well. So 2.11, well, let's go on because, let's go on with 2.10. And with every kind of evil deception of unrighteousness for those who are being led astray, deprived, and destroyed because they have found no love of doctrine so that they might be delivered. It's love for doctrine that really counts. What is your mental attitude toward doctrine? As I said in the last message, some of you weren't here. There's a young man who came to the service every night last week. And while the ranks were thin, I said, well, not many people are here tonight. It might not even be worth going ahead with the message. We'll just cancel it and do it tomorrow when people aren't so busy. And so he looked at me straight in the eye and said, No! I want to hear the Word of God. And he about said it that tough. Not so tough. He's talking to me. But he said it pretty tough. And so I said, All right. I was convicted and said, All right. 
I'll teach you. So it was a class with my wife and this young fellow. And I guarantee you he got more out of the message than some of you ever get because you're so, well, obliv either you're oblivious to it or you don't like it or you do like it but you're too busy being strangled by the weeds in your life. And I say these things with love. It's not that I say these things saying, oh no, nobody's here, I'm so worried. I might lose everything. Oh, <laughs> believe me, I'm not worried about those things. But I do care. And it's a tough love. And you have to be tough. Because some of you are going to have to wake up to the importance of the Word of God. Because I'm telling you our country is very close to the five cycles of discipline. And you might say to yourself, well nobody else cares. I'll just go on my own merry way. But one, two, three people can have enough impact to turn the tide. Moses, one man had enough impact to keep God from wiping out a whole entire generation of people. One man out of two million. One man in the Old Testament. And we have far greater than Moses had. We have the unique spiritual life that Moses never had. And Moses got a glimpse of it and said, Man, I yearn to see that day. He knew what it was all about. And yet we have it. And we trample all over it. Put it number two, number 10 in our life, number 15. It doesn't matter. I'll get back with it later. I'll catch up later. No, it's a daily. You know dedication is not a one-shot deal. It's a daily decision. And I have to get up every morning and study the Word of God. And some of you might not think I do that, but I do. It is impossible for me. You're an idiot if you think I don't study. You're, you're, so, you're, you're a moron if you think I do not study. My goodness, have you ever tried to speak for two hours straight or for at least an hour or an hour and 45 minutes? It takes lots of study and lots of practice. And a lot of times I might not be looking at the computer, but I'm running through these things in my brain. And you have to be able to put words together. And that's why I've changed it to Sunday at 6 and 7. Because it, it really gives me more time. Because a Saturday, it really gives me a day off. Otherwise, I have no time whatsoever. And it, it, it extends the time of study for me in which I can uh, 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 get some study in on Sunday as well and then be fired up for Sunday night, just as like I would be fired up for Monday through Friday. But you need to stop taking the Word of God for granted. You're hearing Matthew. Now, I know it's been taught before, and it's been taught by Colonel Thame, and it was taught excell excellently, and you can listen to it, and you'll get a lot out of it, but I'm coming at it from a different angle. I'm coming at it. You see, he taught that in the 1960s. He taught that before he put together the unique spiritual life in toto. I'm bringing you Matthew uh, just as if uh, he were teaching it today, knowing the whole spiritual life in toto. It is different. And someone insultingly uh, sent me an email and said, it's rehashed thing. Well, it's correct, even if it was. But you know what? I haven't even heard theme 1 through 30. And I didn't listen to it on purpose because I wanted to put this together in the light of the unique spiritual life that he taught and I know. And I wanted to bring it to you uh, from a different angle. And I did not want to rehash it. But people always have to be insulting. And if you know me personally, I would be the last person in the world you'd probably think that would need an insult. But I always get them. But that's part of the job. And I take it. And it doesn't bother me. That's the funny thing about it. And every time it occurs, I receive blessing. And that's even funnier for me. So 2.11... Consequently, due to negative volition, God sends strong delusion on them so that they may believe the lie. 2.11, corrected translation. Consequently, God sends strong delusion on them so that they may believe the lie. Now this is the total life of the person in the cosmic system. What happens is they live their whole life in the cosmic system. So when they hear the truth, they immediately reject it. They are immediately offended. They hear the truth contrary to what they've ever heard and they are offended. 
and they believe the lie. They would rather believe the lie. It, you know what? It's more comfortable for them to be right in their own minds than to figure out that they're wrong and to change their mind. It's more comfortable for them to be right and say, you know what, I do have to change my lifestyle. That guy is wrong when he says that. I never said you must not change your lifestyle. I said for some people it would be recommended, especially for the gossip, the maligner, and the judger, especially for those people who reject it right off and then go around nee, 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 just because they rejected it. Well, knee, 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 knee yourself right into divine discipline, you fool. You've got to get to a point where you have to take yourself out of the equation, take my personality out of the equation, and say, I'm getting something I cannot get anywhere else. And if you're honest with yourself, you can say to yourself, I cannot get this anywhere else. And if you can, go there. You are not forced to be here. So 2.11, consequently, due to negative volition, God sends strong delusion on them so that they may believe the lie. They are living under the cosmic system, and strong delusion can ruin a client nation to God. And strong delusion will ruin this client nation. Part of strong delusion is when the whole populace believes, when the politician gets up and says, peace and prosperity, and they believe that and vote for them. When there is no peace and prosperity, and there will not be peace and prosperity for this country for years to come unless people wake up to the importance of the Word of God. It's that serious. And your impact, you have the ability in your spiritual life, your invisible impact to turn things around. Even a small group like this, remember Moses, one, preserved two million. There are what? How many here today? Six, seven? I don't know or eight, or whatever. But if all of us went to play Roma, fulfilled the whole route of our spiritual life, the impact would be phenomenal. You wouldn't know even how great it would be. But when all of us, for example, when we have a prayer meeting next Sunday at 545, and all of us sit down in prayer for our president and our country, and we have effectual prayers, God hears that. He doesn't hear the prayers of about 99.8% uh, uh, of all the believers out there because they don't even know how to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And we studied prayer and how to pray and we looked at it from Scripture and they don't know how. So when they go in prayer, they're not even heard. And it's tragic. And they might pray for the president and for the country and it bounces around in their head and God doesn't hear it. But when we get together knowing these spiritual matters and we come together in prayer, God hears it, and it's effective. It does have an impact. And you've got to start realizing the importance of all of these things, far more important than anything else in life. 2.12, And so they will all be condemned who have not believed the truth, but took pleasure in evil. You see, they lived their whole life in the cosmic system, and they take pleasure in it now. And the cosmic system has its own form of promotion as well. And most people who are in the cosmic system for an extended period of time take pleasure in it. They wouldn't know how to live a spirit-filled life because well, they can't gossip about anybody anymore. Well, how boring is that? Like uh, so many people you might have known, uh, and all you do, all they do at work is gossip and gossip, and finally you learn something and say, look, I don't want to gossip about that. And then they say, well, we won't have anything to talk about then. <laughs> well, the, 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 they look at you like you're weird. <laughs> well, you are weird. You're royal family of God. You're, you're above all that junk. So they love it. They love gossiping, maligning, and judging. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel better than or holier than. And you're not. Remember, get the log out of your own eye. You have a log in your eye. But instead you want to take pleasure in evil, you'll be punished. So the pivot will be gone during the tribulation. Remember, all the believers are removed from the earth at the resurrection of the church. Poof, we're all in heaven. What's left on the earth is a whole bunch of unbelievers. Not one believer at that 
instant. Not one. More will come along later. But at that point, none. So there will be a period of unrestrained disaster. When there is a removal of a pivot, or when the pivot of mature believers shrinks, then follows disaster. The same holds true for the millennium, except it will be intensified because at the start of it, there won't even be one believer. So this is something that we must point, we must uh, write a point on because it's extraordinarily important. Point one, environment does not dictate one's decisions. Environment, what's environment? That is where you live. That is who your parents are. That is whether you live in a trailer or whether you live in a mansion that's a five stories high. That's your environment, your condition of living. An environment does not dictate one's decisions. Decisions dictate one's environment. Decisions dictate one's environment. Environment does not dictate one's decisions. Decisions dictate one's environment. And this is true both collectively and individually. So this is true for the country. And when you decide, when enough believers decide to get with the word of God, you actually dictate the environment of that country. You dictate whether the crime will be low or high. You dictate whether we have good leadership or bad leadership most of the time. And you dictate whether we win wars or lose wars. And you dictate whether we're prosperous or going into poverty. It's all up to the believer and the pivot. And when the pivot's gone, and when believers let the weeds of life uh, grow up and strangle them away from doctrine, then you will be responsible for the destruction of this country. You, us, believers, we're the ones that hold the torch. That's why in the tribulation, everything goes to hell. That's, we won't be there, and you can thank God for that. But that's when blood will flow in the streets all the way up to the horse's bridle. And there will be complete destruction. And we have the ability in this country to very easily move to the fifth cycle of discipline. One thing, and one thing only, is holding it back, and that is that there are a few people who care enough for the word of God that God does just as he did in the case of Moses. And he says, all right, for your sake, Moses, I'll preserve this people. And for us, he does the same thing. And while he doesn't talk to us today directly, we can know that this country is still surviving because there's a few people out there who executed the spiritual life and he says to them, all right, I'll spare this country for a little while longer for your sake. Just as he spared Israel on many occasions for David's sake, even after he had been dead for a couple hundred years. And that is the impact of the mature believer in the Old Testament. It is amplified today. And we have far greater impact. Then in 716 it says, You will recognize them by their production. People don't gather grapes from thorns or figs from cacti, do they? So when you grow in grace and in knowledge, you become keenly aware of what is divine good and what is human good. You're no longer impressed with people who do good works to receive the praise of man. You're no longer impressed by people because they act sweet. You're no longer impressed by people uh, because of anything, really, because it's all God's doing. And what you do is you grow in discernment. And until you grow in grace and in knowledge, you'll never have discernment concerning people. And you will be bamboozled by all types of people. And people will come up to you and say, I'm a Christian. Help me out. And you'll feel bad for them and help them out. And they'll say, I'll, go ahead. I'll pay you back next week. And you never see the money again. You never see their faces again. You've been bamboozled. But when you have doctrine, you're no longer impressed by people simply with the words of their mouth. And you don't know whether or not uh, someone is spiritual by what holy language they use. So you must grow in discernment. So you will recognize a false teacher. I guess I should chew myself out for that one. 
For you will see them trying to gather grapes from thorns and cacti, teaching legalism which strangles and does not edify. 717, but if I threw myself out, <laughs> there would be no use. 717, in the same way, every good tree bears good fruit. I know I married her for a reason. She has a sense of humor. 717, in the same way, every good tree bears divine good fruit, but the bad tree bears spoiled fruit. Spoiled fruit is, of course, human good, and uh, the good fruit is, of course, divine good. A good tree, a believer in fellowship, is not able to bear spoiled fruit, nor a corrupt tree to bear good fruit. 719, every tree, I went over this earlier on Friday, that's why I'm going quickly through this. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Remember all human good for the believer will be burned at the Bema. All human good for the unbeliever will be judged at the last judgment. 720, so then you will recognize them by their fruit. And this is discernment as to what constitutes the Christian way of life. It does, this doesn't mean you recognize them for being religious. This doesn't mean you recognize them for their human good works that they do on Sunday for the eyes of men only. You see, they go to church on Sunday, and they're called the nod to God crowd. They go to church once on Sunday to nod to God, to acknowledge Him. Yes, God, you're there. And I give 10% today. I acknowledge you. And then they go home. What about the other six days of the week? Oh, I pray on Wednesday. Yeah, outside of fellowship. What about the other days? Isn't the Christian way of life one day at a time or just uh, once on Sunday? And do you think the Apostle Paul said, I'll teach once on Sunday. I've got too much to do. No. He taught every day. And in fact, he taught people's, people's ears off so much they didn't even get a chance to eat during his messages. Same thing happened with Jesus Christ. And then uh, all the disciples got hungry. And then they went and said, oh, Lord, we got to let these people go. In other words, Lord, I'm hungry. Let's go eat. But they said, Lord, we got to let these people go. We, uh, they got to go eat as if they weren't talking to the Messiah. And so then he said, all right, we'll feed them. And so here's a, a basket of fish. And then it's turned into 5,000. And then to teach them a lesson, he says, all right, here's 5,000 fish. Now spread it out like a bunch of waiters. You see, they didn't come up and get it. He made uh, Peter and the disciples hand the fish out <laughs> so that they could see, look, Jesus Christ is going to provide, you fools. But see, they got distracted by their hungry stomachs. And they were idiots too, just as we are. All of us, myself included, at times. 717, or now in 721, we have the judgment of false teachers. Not everyone who says to me in eternity, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. The one who does the will of my Father, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So we must refer back to the narrow gate comment. What is the will of the Father in heaven? For everyone to enter in by the way of the narrow gate. What is the narrow gate? Faith alone in Christ alone, no other way of salvation. So this is the Father's will. So not everyone who says to me in eternity, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, which is to believe in Christ. 7.22 on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and do many wonderful deeds? These are the false teachers. These are the false teachers that you see on television today who preach about Jesus all the time, who use his name all the time and who claim to do miracles in his name, if they are doing miracles, it's in the name of Beelzebub, Satan, not in the name of Jesus, but they use his name. And they never even give the gospel, they just hit people on the head. And they think that's a means of salvation, and it is not. And I've seen these whole things. 
And I've always, and I've watched them, and I watched the whole thing just to see if they would give the gospel. Because I would try, at least a little bit, to give them the benefit of the doubt and say, all right, uh, they may be way off and think sincerely that they can produce miracles. Well, let me see if they give the gospel. No. The whole 30 minutes or an hour is spent bopping people on the head, and they say, Jesus, Jesus, but they never say, believe in Christ. So there could be a whole slew of unbelievers there who never get the gospel, and the person doing it is probably not even saved. So they will go to heaven, and they will be at the last judgment. You see, they're brought up to heaven from Hades at the last judgment, and there they will say, but Lord, I prophesied in your name. I don't understand while I was in Hades. I, I talked about you all the time. I said, Jesus this and Jesus that. And then what does Jesus say to them? 7.23 Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, lawbreakers. So just because people use a holy language, just because people use Jesus' name, just because people hold to a form of the spiritual life doesn't mean that they're saved. And, just, and if they've never believed in Christ, they can constantly invoke his name until the cows come home and they're still not saved. If you haven't believed in Christ, you're simply not saved. And you can talk about Jesus Christ, but you're talking about a different Jesus Christ, not the one who has saved. So what they do is always perform under human good, never produce d divine good, and they never come to know Christ. And therefore, Christ never knew them and says, Go away from me. Now we move on to hearing and doing in chapter 7, verse 24. Everyone who hears these words, that is the good news, everyone who hears the good news of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. That means they've received the gospel message and they've believed it. And of course, when you believe in Christ, you are building your house, your edification complex, as it were, on a rock. Jesus Christ is the rock. So then in 725, the rain fell, the flood came, and the winds beat against that house. But it did not collapse because it had been founded on the rock. Jesus Christ is the rock who provides eternal security. The house was built on the rock. So no matter what, you cannot lose your salvation. And, of course, the church is built on a rock as well. And the church, those who have believed in Christ, all of us who have believed in Christ, cannot lose our salvation. Yet, still, he's dealing with Jews. And this might be a foretelling of the church that is to come, but that they would have no clue what he's talking about. But the fact is, when you believe in Christ, you cannot lose your salvation because you're founded on a rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, does not believe in me, is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Now this is someone who's received the gospel, but they've rejected the gospel. They received it, then rejected it. The sand is his own good deeds, human good and works. He's building it on sand, human good and works, constantly shifting. We are man. We cannot produce the righteousness of God. We cannot produce the foundation of the rock. The rain fell, the flood came, and the winds beat against the house, and it collapsed. It was a tremendous fall. That's the corrected translation. The rain fell, the flood came, and the winds beat against the house, and it collapsed. It was a tremendous fall. So the foolish man goes to hell because of the rejection of the gospel. For the sand, the sand refers to his good deeds, his human good, his human works, were not sufficient enough to hold the house in place. So it fell, and he fell. But remember, when you believe in Christ, you cannot fall. Oh, you can fail in life, but you can't lose your salvation. Another reference to eternal security, they are found throughout Scripture. 728, we'll wrap up here. 728. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were shocked by his teaching. Shocked. 
Jesus Christ is not a mealy mouth. Jesus Christ was not someone who was sweet to everyone. The crowds were shocked at him. Just as many people, if I've looked out at your eyeballs, get shocked at me. So what? It's the word of God. And Jesus Christ did not pull any punches. He was not sweet to people who needed a kick in the butt. And all of us need a kick in the butt. And remember, the word of God is for reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. Instruction, correction. It's not for me to tickle your ears and to make you feel good. That's ridiculous. And Jesus Christ definitely, definitely made a lot of people feel very, very bad. The crowds were shocked by his teaching because he repeatedly, so when I repeat, don't roll your eyes, because he repeatedly taught them like one who had authority. Authority. And he did. And not like the experts in the law. The experts in the law would say, oh, this passage could mean this or it could mean that. And if you're offended, it probably means the other thing. <laughs> but Jesus spoke with authority and he says the scripture means this the scripture says you are a hypocrite you are a sinner yet you think you're so holy you think you're holy by your good works all of you are going to hell you bunch of religious nitwits hypocrite snakes brood of vipers insulting see and if you, if some of the uh, Baptist preachers and Methodists especially around here were to hear that, they would be shocked. Their eyes would, and they would look shocked. And just, I cannot believe he said that. And on top of that, he claims to be the Son of God. Then they would hang him on a cross because they would say, he can't be the Son of God and talk to me like that. They took it very personally, but he wasn't. But, but uh, Jesus Christ taught with authority, and not like the experts in the law. The experts in the law were the sweet people. They were the people who always cared about the approval of others. Now, any pastor who is ever going to get up and try to be one needs to be aware. Needs to at least have enough spiritual growth to say to themselves, if people reject it. They're not rejecting me, they're rejecting the word. And while they might use you as an excuse, it's not an excuse. They use Christ as an excuse. Oh, he doesn't teach like the people who teach the law. He's talking with authority. He shocks me. He offends me. So if you ever think you have the gift of pastor teacher, you cannot compromise and you have to understand going into it, you are going to receive hate. Vitriolic hate. You're going to receive hate like you've never known it before. And all you have to do is relax and realize that Jesus Christ himself, a man of perfection, received hate. So then uh, tomorrow night, we'll begin with the power of the king in chapter 8. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things, and may we come to understand that it's not the man, but the message. And may we come to understand from these things that we must be humble enough to take reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness so that we can grow in grace and in knowledge, so that we can do the most important thing of all of life, which is to glorify you. And we pray for our president that you will uh, continue to give him good counsel and may you uh, guide him in wisdom so that he can fight this worldwide war on terror effectively. And um, may uh, you also, if it be your will, continue to shield this country from the terrorist onslaught and from the coming cycles of discipline. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.